Let us pray together. I'd like to begin actually by offering the color appointed for today. Lord of all power and might, author and giver of all good things, craft in our hearts the love of everyone. Increase in us true religion. Nourish us with all goodness and bring forth in us the fruit of good works. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. First of all, a welcome and a greeting to all of those uh, who are watching this, both here as well as on live stream. I cannot tell you how glad and even eager I have been to be able to come and to preside at this service with the welcome of your new record. Uh, I'm thrilled that Porter and his family are here. I'm thrilled for you, parishioners at St. David's by the Sea. Uh, I have wondrous hope, and I look forward, quite honestly, to seeing what God is going to do in and through the life of this congregation. Because the coming of a new rector is an invitation. It's an invitation actually primarily from God to discover in a new way what God has called St. David's to be. And what it is that they are called to become. Because any rector worth the salt brings a new vision. He brings a new understanding of what it means to be a follower of Jesus and the Episcopalian. He brings with him an interest and a hope to discover not only what God has done here in the past, and you have quite a past to talk about, and as well as an opportunity to be able to think together that in the light of what God has done and what the scriptures teach, what is God asking of this church now? In other words, this really is an opportunity for a kind of fresh beginning, built upon the very best of the past, and moving forward, in essence, in a new era, in a new step that God would have for the life of this congregation. In other words, let me put a very strong point. God has not called a new rector to maintain as much as God has called a new rector to create the opportunity for a fresh beginning. An opportunity to be able to discover in a whole new way what it means to be a follower of Jesus, what it means to be Christian, what it means to be parishioners here at St. David's Church in the Diocese of Central Florida. That's the new vista that is in fact opened up. And I'm, I'm thrilled that Porter is here to help me that. So what I want to do in a very, very kind of brief way is talk a little bit about what that kind of new beginning might look like. Three points, of course, because it's a pretty standard outline for a preacher. <laughs> Number one, common vision. Number two, common love. Three, common mission. So vision, love, mission. All of which I think are actually contained and the scriptures are appointed for this morning. These actually are not the scriptures that are often used for the celebration of new ministry and the institution of new record. Instead, these are the lessons that are appointed for this Sunday that God willing has been read throughout the Episcopal Church, because, but I couldn't think of any that were more appropriate to what's going on here, which is why I chose them, as opposed to the lessons that are often read at celebration of new ministry. Besides, that way you know you're giving a fresh sermon and not something that I'm preaching. <laughs> so, briefly, common vision. You see, both in the case of Moses and the story of Moses encountering God in the burning bush, and in the Gospel reading, where Peter is in fact upbraided severely for having a very wrong idea of what Jesus was to do. In both cases, what's going on is that God, in both cases, is giving up, creating a kind of reset. You think God operates this way. But what I'm telling you is, this is God speaking, I'm operating this way. 
and they're different. I don't know what Moses knew about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Jacob. You see, he had been raised, if you recall, in Pharaoh's household. What he would have known is the adoration of the sun god and the panoply of heaven, exhibited in the extraordinary polytheism that was in Egypt at the time. It would only have been after he had gotten into the wilderness that he began to hear new stories that he may not have heard before about what the Hebrew understanding of God actually was, not polytheistic, but one. In other words, the contrast could not have been greater, which is why you hear in the lesson God speaking very specifically. Who am I? I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In other words, I am the God of your ancestors, and I'm calling you to do something for your people. Moses never expected that to be the case for him. And so what you see all through the Exodus story, not just here, is that God, in essence, has to tutor Moses about who God is. And as a result, what actually is possible, what God can do in the life of an individual, and what God's plan was for the nation of Israel. Again, whether Moses had ever heard these stories before, we don't know. But what we see is God, in essence, creating for Moses a new understanding of who God was, and out of that, a new possibility for what God was calling Moses to do and what was to happen to the people of Israel. The same for Peter. You see, remember, if you look at the vision of what the Old Testament teaches, who is the man blessed by God? The one who lives to see his children's children. One who enjoys prosperity and the fruit of the land. One who is spoken well of by his neighbors and his friends. Anything other than that brings questions about, well, are you actually experiencing God's favor if those things aren't true for you? Who sinned, O oh Lord, this man or his ancestors, that he should be born blind? You see, if something, if there were bad things happening, that had everything to do with that somehow God was against you. And yet here is Jesus talking to his disciples that what's going to happen to him, Messiah, Son of God, is that he is in fact going to be arrested, crucified on a cross, and rise again from the dead. Even though Jesus had spoken of this more than once, it, it takes a while for it to sink in. And finally, when Peter grasps what it is that Jesus is describing, he thinks that can't be true. It can't be true. If you are God's chosen, that you're going to be cursed on a tree, how is that even possible? There was no room in Peter to be able to understand that. No wonder Jesus pivots. I mean, you have the sense that Jesus is here, Peter is back here, and he's pleading with Jesus. And finally, Jesus turns, faces Peter. But notice what he says. We would consider it shockingly on God. Get behind me, Satan, he says. You are stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. In other words, Jesus is saying in the strongest possible terms that an understanding of God does not line up with what we see in the life, death, and resurrection and the teachings of Jesus is not from God. And in fact, it can even be from the evil one. You see, we believe as Christians, and this is what Jesus teaches, is that the centrality of who Jesus is, is in his death and resurrection. There is no other event that is more important than that, because that is, the, that is what, in fact, opens the door for eternal life. That was his mission to be, as the scripture says later, the firstborn of many brothers and sisters, to receive us as a new family based on forgiveness and mercy, on the promise of eternal life, not just a good teacher who exemplified something of the love of God, but the centrality of Jesus' life is what we see in the death and resurrection. And there are plenty of people that want to peddle to you and me 
the version of Jesus that does not put the sacrificial death and resurrection of Jesus front and center. But that is, in fact, what makes him and expresses in the strongest terms of who he is as God in the flesh, the Son of God who came to save sinners. It's more than aspirational teaching. It is more than an exemplary life. It is a message of love that challenges us because it brings us up short, all of our pretensions, to be something other than someone who is in deep need of redemption and forgiveness are called to the front. And we are called to bend the knees and say, oh Lord, you are the one that I need above all of us. You are the one who sees more than anything all the great darkness in life that exists in our heart. You see, a common vision is a common understanding of the life and ministry of Jesus and who he is. And what that invites us into, you see, is a common love because we understand that we are debtors, we are heirs, we are people who could not make it without the mercy and grace of Jesus. And what that arises and creates in us is a passion, a love for him. that can never be accomplished if all we think about is that the role of the Christian life is to somehow try to be good. I have to tell you, if the whole sum of the Christian life is to try to be good, then I'm not miserable. <laughs> I mean, come on, husbands and wives, ask your spouses. It is deeper than that. It has to do with a change of heart. It has to do with the forgiveness of mercy of God, for which I am so profoundly in need. So that it is, in fact, a message of pardon, victory, and eternal life that literally changes me, opens the doors of my heart to a new love that I never expected before, and out of that creates a common love. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit. What? That we may perfectly love him and worthily magnify your holy name. In other words, what Cranner saying in that colic that we say pretty much every Sunday when there's communion is that what binds us together, what unites us, what we have in common, is that wonderful sense that we are debtors to Christ and that we love him. That we love him. And it is out of that love that we're invited to a new kind of mission. A mission where as men and women who are literally being changed by God to live out a life together that expresses and invites others into that very same love. That's my hope. St. David's by the sea. That in this new era, based on the best of what is in your past, Twitter might work with you and you with him because you will have things to teach him as well as things that he will want to teach you about what it means, in fact, to love God, to love God, to love one another. And out of that, we begin to find a new way to express that kind of loving care to this community. It's my hope for you that there be that kind of passion and that great joy of knowing that I've been welcomed and included into a family that loves me, calls me to be my best in the kingdom of God, who forgives as I need forgiveness every day. So I look forward to this. I'm excited about the future. And I do pray that as you wrestle together, love well, find ways to serve, lots of joy and laughter, great food, common mission, all of the things for which St. David's is known. There might be a kind of refreshing, refreshing sense of God's hand here in a way that will call many to know him.